Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I started out at RIT uh, in 2001, came into the mechanical engineering department. It's been a great ride. It's been a pleasure to come to work every single day over the, more than the last decade. And this summer, I took on a different role, a new role within the College of Engineering. So I'm now serving as the Associate Dean for Research and Graduate Studies in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering and as director of the new PhD in Engineering program that's just been launched this year. What I'm hoping to do this afternoon is to share with you our vision for where we're taking this new doctoral program in engineering and to help you get excited about the opportunity that you as an individual engineer can have in making a true difference in the world. You know, when I talk to young students and their parents, when they're considering what they want to do with their high school, and beyond high school, going into college education, the one thing that always comes up in those conversations is that these young people want to make a difference. People become engineers because they want to make a difference in the world. Well, I'd like to present to you one opportunity today of a very specific way in which you can make a difference in the world. And in particular, we're embarking on a path now in the, in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering to try to bring resources together in terms of faculty research groups, students, graduate students working on these projects, and to really make a contribution to the solution of several daunting problems of global significance. So our goal is to make a difference in the world. Uh, you've seen the abstract, perhaps, of what we're going to talk about today in the seminar announcement. Really, I'd like to share with you the perspectives on why we've structured the doctoral program in engineering the way that we have, what we're planning to do as part of the curriculum, and then how you can get involved uh, in this program if it's something that you want to do to help make a difference in the world going forward. So I'm going to follow kind of the standard reporting uh, structure. You know, if in journalism you learn about telling all the facts. Well, I want to not only tell facts, but I want to try and tell a story here to explain to you the, the view, the vision of where this program's coming from and where we hope to take it going into the future. So why did we pick the application domains that we're going to be focusing on? What's the, why do, are we motivated to do this degree program in the first place? What exactly is, is it that we do? What are the technology strengths here in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering that we're going to play to and build upon? How do we go about delivering our technical strengths to the solution of these daunting problems of national and international significance? And then who can be involved, whether you're faculty, students, staff, uh, what are the mechanisms that you can get involved in? And then what's the timeline if you're interested in getting involved in this program? It's kind of an overview of what we're talking about. I'm going to use different terminology as we go through the presentation today. I'll talk about application domains and technology domains. And the application domains really describe our historical perspective at RIT. Since the first days at RIT, we've been a career-oriented institution. We've had historically very strong ties with industry partners. We want to maintain those corporate connections in this new doctoral program that have been a linchpin of all of our undergraduate programs and our graduate programs. So we looked to the marketplace and we said, what are some of the key industries for the future in the United States and globally, and what are some of the key problems associated with those industries? So these application domains describe the market-driven problems that we're choosing to tackle. There are a lot of problems in the, in the world today. There are a lot of opportunities for engineers to make a difference. So we've tried to pick four application domains that we think have an opportunity to make a positive impact on every single person on planet Earth. That's our goal. All right. So why should we, why do we uh, want to have you consider becoming engaged with this PhD program? Well, first of all, going back to that thing that motivates all young people when they're deciding what to do with their life. It's, Almost 90%, almost exclusively, when I ask people what they want to do, they say they want to make a difference. The way they want to make a difference can be as varied as the individual, but that's a recurring theme. 
So we're going to give students and faculty an opportunity to make a positive difference in the world, to work across disciplinary boundaries. And you've probably heard Dean Palmer say many, many times that real world problems don't respect disciplinary boundaries. Any one of us working as an individual probably doesn't have the technical skills and expertise to solve one of these great, big, large-scale, daunting problems. We have to work together. We have to come together with different technical backgrounds, whether it's mechanical or electrical or chemical engineering. All the different flavors of engineering disciplines have to be brought to bear on these daunting problems. And indeed, just the engineering disciplines by themselves are not sufficient. Many of the challenging problems that we face nationally and globally have significant policy aspects associated with them. We can come up with the greatest technical solution, and if we don't have the political and the social infrastructure to support that solution, it's not going to be successful in the marketplace. So we have identified four application domains that we're going to initially focus on in this PhD program in engineering. And those include transportation, energy, communications, and healthcare. Why did we pick these four particular application domains? Well, we did an analysis of uh, different segments of the United States economy. So using information presented by the Bureau of Economic Analysis from the US Department of Commerce, we studied the gross domestic product. So that's the overall output, the financial output of the entire US economy. This pie chart shows all of the private sector contributions to the US economy. So this particular chart excludes government expenditures. And using that analysis, we've identified that transportation, energy, communications, and healthcare, collectively, those four segments account for about one third of the entire US economy. And if we think about those uh, application domains, those are global. Transportation, in one way or another, affects everyone. Energy affects every single person on the planet. Communications has the potential to phenomenally change the way we think around the about the world around us. And healthcare is in the news every day. Look at some of the crises that we're facing on the African continent with the Ebola outbreak today, for example. These four application domains are not only important sectors of our economy, but they bring a host of important problems that need to be solved. That's why we're focusing on these particular application domains. So I know everybody's going to look at, okay, so transportation is $2 trillion. That's a lot of, there's six more zeros after those dollar signs up there. Um, what about that $15.9 trillion big slice of the pie that we haven't looked at? So I know you're, gonna, you're just aching to know what are in those other slices. Um, we've chosen tech because they are really represent very significant problems of uh, national and global importance. Let's look at these other slices here. So you can see that finance and trade, this big green block here, uh, that represents a big chunk of the overall economy. Well, that includes import, export, and all of these other things. So implicitly, those are the similar technologies that we see reflected in the earlier pie slices. So down here we see opportunities for growth in construction and manufacturing. So tech, transportation, energy, communications, and healthcare represent the initial problem sets that we're planning to focus on. In the future, as we make contributions in those fields, we may expand our vision to include other areas of the economy. So the idea is that this degree structure is flexible or nimble so that we can respond to changing needs in the marketplace without having to restructure the entire degree program. These are just shifting applications that 50 years from now may have a different focus that we want to, to look at. This slide also includes the blue and the tan uh, section up here at the front. So this represents other services as part of our service economy. You hear a lot of talk about you know, the service economy in the US or the information economy. Well, the service economy is important, but it, it's really not as significant as some of the traditional aspects of their economy that have been the mainstay of the economy forever. And then uh, this other services, that represents all state, local, and federal government expenditures. 
So it gives you a feeling for the fraction of government as a function of the overall market uh, in the United States. So again, this is looking at some historical perspectives. So within those four application domains now, what are the unique problems that we're initially going to focus on? There are a number of reports that are published both by national agencies as well as international organizations. For example, the World Health Organization publishes documents every couple of years about Im you know, important problems that are facing every person on the planet, globally relevant problems. In the United States, pretty much every executive level department in the US government publishes a strategic plan that looks five to 10 years into the future of what are the important issues facing this department whether it's the Department of Energy or the Department of Transportation, the Department of Education, all of these different departments develop forward-looking strategic plans. And when you look at the list of authors on those strategic plans, it's a pretty impressive group. They're individuals that think long and deep and hard about that respective field. And then there's an organization called the National Academy of Engineering, which publishes grand challenges, really big meaty problems that engineers need to be taken a look at because of their significance in the, in the global economy. So this list of grand challenge style problems, we've identified four or five big meaty problems in each of these four, four technology or application domains. These application domains uh, have many problems. Every single one of these bullets under each application domain is related to a national or a global priority. We know those problems are important. Because they're important, because both US and international agencies view them as important, we also know that there's gonna be research support for those areas. There's gonna be funding available to pursue that kind of work. Let's look a little bit at perspectives on research and development. So I've been talking about these market drivers uh, from an economic perspective. Well, what are the drivers that really make R&D happen? What, where does R&D come from? And I'm gonna focus initially on a little bit of a global perspective and then move down more locally towards uh, R&D expenditures in the United States in particular. So, Let's look at a number of different countries here. So we have the United States, a number of um, leading countries all across the world, Japan, Germany, France, the UK, et cetera. And in particular, I'm gonna draw your attention to some trends between the United States and China. And we have about a 20 year history here from 1990 up until uh, about 2000, almost 2010, nearly 20 years of history. We'd like to look at a couple of interesting uh, data points about this observation. First of all, uh, let's look at the United States and China and compare what's happening historically in those two economies. So this represents, this slide represents research expenditures by that country as a percentage of that country's gross domestic product, their total economic output. So in the United States, R&D expenditures have hovered right around 25 2.6, 2.7% .6, for the last 20 years. They're pretty much flat. If you look at other economies around the world, you can see how those have changed over time. Some, eco some economies are pumping more money into R&D, others are uh, reducing R&D. You can oftentimes relate this to um, strategic things or things that are happening in society. So for example, look back here in 1990 to 1995, where R&D expenditures in Russia went from 2.03% to less than 1%. What happened there? The fall of the Soviet Union, right? So their whole country fundamentally shifted. You can see global trends by looking at how these things that are happening in society impact how a country views their R&D environment. Now, conversely, if you look at China, in 1990, we didn't have data available, but look at how research expenditures are growing in China as a function of their GDP. China's clearly on the move. They're, they're putting more and more focus, a bigger percentage of their economy into R&D. Well, that's important to understand. So as a fact, 
from this data, we can conclude that R&D expenditures in the USA have remained relatively flat as a percentage of GDP over two decades. Whereas in China, they've more than doubled as a function of GDP in the past two decades. So it's important as a result of that, that our graduates that come out of this doctoral program in engineering not only be able to do quality research, but that they be able to translate the discoveries coming out of their research into practice. So that's another theme. We're going to do quality research, and we're going to make that research have an impact. Translate that discovery into practice. Let's look in a little bit more detail at US R&D expenditures. I know these are eye charts. The intent here is just to get a couple of, uh, couple of points across, not to have you read all of the data. But I want to orient you to what's on the data. So we have a historical perspective of research and development expenditures from 1980 up through 2008. And then we have the sources of funds. Who's paying for R&D in the United States? So we have the federal government private sector industry, universities and colleges, nonprofit organizations, and non-federal government, like state agencies. And we see uh, trends, how each of these has grown over time. And then let's look at what that money gets spent on. What's the nature of research that's being performed? And there's three major categories. First is basic research, fundamental understanding of the world around us and how it works. Then we have applied research, which is really take, trying to take that understanding of the world and move it into practical application. So that's really kind of the world of engineering, right? We have the pure sciences and we have the applied sciences. And then development is when we're moving beyond the fundamental and applied research stage into technology deployment, product development, really monetizing or commercializing or putting a, a new technology into practice. All right, so let's look at a couple of important trends, particularly in the last uh, half a decade or so, and the importance of the different uh, natures of investment here. We notice that industry expenditures on R&D have exceeded the combined federal uh, government expenditures every year since 1980 with a widening gap. Applied R&D, applied development, applied research expenditures exceed fundamental research expenditures in 28 out of the 29 years presented here. And development, of expen development expenditures, that third column on what we do with funds, uh, that's exceeded the sum of basic and applied research every single year since 1980. So what implications does that mean for us. It means that it's important for our program as we look to design it and develop it going forward to have a very meaningful research and development component. We need to do both. Fundamental research and applied research and development if we're going to have a true impact in the world. Now let's take a look at R&D expenditures uh, in particular at universities in the United States. So we have uh, all of the different sources of funds. And now down here, let's look at the fields of investigation. So the physical sciences, for example, include things like chemistry and physics. We have environmental, mathematical sciences, computer sciences. I would like to draw your attention in particular to life sciences and engineering, these two rows. So if we look at life sciences since the year 2000, and indeed since uh, even before that, look at life sciences and engineering, those combined two areas dominate the R&D landscape at the federal level. So clearly that's where our nation is investing in research and development, is in the life sciences and it's in uh, engineering fields, and it's in a combination of research, applied research, fundamental research, and technology development. So it's pretty clear that we, we want to design our research program, if we're going to have an impact, to be responsive to industry needs and the government needs, because that's um, where we're going to ultimately get support for driving our research. Right. So what exactly is it that we do? Up until now, I've been talking kind of about why we do this. You know, what are the, uh, why are we motivated to tackle these problems? 
transportation, energy, communications, and healthcare. Hopefully I've made the case that they're important problems. They're important nationally and they're important globally. Now what is it that we do? Well here in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering, if we look at all of the strengths across the college, all of the different departments and programs, the things that individual faculty members are working on, the, the uh, tasks that their students are working on, the different areas of technology, we're trying to really get a good understanding of our strongest technology domain. In this next couple of slides, I'll be very frank, it's still a work in progress, and I welcome your input on identifying across the entire college what are our, what are our technical strengths. So technology really represents what we do as opposed to why we do it. So this is based on a, just about a week or so of analysis of trying to identify uh, a small number of themes and particular technologies in the College of Engineering where we can po point to multiple faculty members across multiple departments working in a particular technology domain. We hope to refine this, narrow it down, and really come up with a strong, compelling statement of here's, wh here's what RIT is strong at in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering. And we're still working on that. But I think this, this gives you a laundry list, and I'm confident that every, for every single bullet on that laundry list, we can point to three or four faculty members in labs and research projects that support every one of those bullets. Now what we want to do is to say, okay, let's take those things that we're strong at doing and how do we apply those areas of technical strength to solve problems of global significance. So our goal is to take our technical strengths, bring people together across departmental boundaries and pick problems to work on collaboratively that have a meaningful impact. And each one of these um, colored bullets here indicates that I've been able to point to one or more examples of a cross-departmental collaboration in the College of Engineering that's using that particular technology to address a problem in that particular domain. Clearly, we're already doing work in these four application domains across all of these technology domains. Now we need to find a way to look for the synergies between them. All right, so how do we go about tackling these problems? So we've talked about the, the driving motivations of the problems, what our strengths are, how do we bring those strengths to bear on actually making a solution? Well, that's where the doctoral program in engineering comes in, in the design of the curriculum, how we hope to uh, engage students working with faculty members to solve real world problems. So whenever we write a new academic program proposal on campus, we have to write the, the program outcomes. What is it that we expect this program to accomplish or deliver on behalf of the institution? So every undergraduate program in the College of Engineering has a set of program outcomes that are published on, on the website. Every graduate program in the College of Engineering has a set of program outcomes. And all of those programs should be designing their curricula and their coursework and their learning experiences and the research experiences for the students that are engaged in those programs to support those outcomes. These are the program outcomes for the doctoral program in engineering. To conduct interdisciplinary re research to make a difference in these four application domains. To produce graduates who uh, are strong in the marketplace, who are technically competent but who also are able to communicate their results and work as members of uh, integrated product development teams. So at the big picture, these three program outcomes are tied to the history of what RIT is all about. We have always been a market-driven institution. We've always been career-oriented. We're going to continue to be career-oriented, but what's different is that the nature of the careers that our students are pursuing as graduates of the institution is beginning to shift. So as the careers that you pursue are shifting, we have to shift our preparation for those careers. We continue to remain market driven. That's, that's always been a theme of RIT. Our graduates have always been technically strong. We're not going to give up on that. So these first two things of 
market-driven market and technically strong, those are hallmarks of every RIT program in the College of Engineering. We've always done that. What we're hoping to bring in with this doctoral program is not only to produce graduates that are employable and, and make our, have good opportunities in the marketplace, they're recognized as having outstanding strengths, but we want to produce graduates that make a difference once they enter that marketplace. Whether you're working as an individual entrepreneur or whether you're working for a Fortune 50 company, we want to help you be one of the movers and shakers of the future. And you're going to do that with strong technical skills. All right, so let's look at some of the guiding principles behind developing this PhD in engineering. We didn't want to go back and create um, siloed organizations. So in many institutions, you have a PhD in mechanical engineering and a PhD in electrical engineering and a PhD in computer engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And in many programs, particularly in smaller programs, when they're just getting started, each one of these individual departments struggles to put together meaningful graduate coursework and, and communities of students working together to really have valid interactions and to, and to make a vibrant research community. So we didn't want to build those um, silos. We didn't want to make those barriers because we know real world problems don't respect disciplinary boundaries. So let's build a curriculum that's flexible so that students from any one of our academic programs that we already offer in the College of Engineering can participate in this program from whatever perspective their, their technical strength is. So if you're a mechanical engineer or a chemical engineer or a biomedical engineer, you're welcome in this program. Graduates that come out of our program, although it's, it doesn't have the traditional silo effects, you need to be individually technically competent in your own discipline so that you can compete effectively with graduates from other traditional programs. So when you graduate from here uh, in a doctoral program like this, you may be competing against a student that has a traditional mechanical engineering PhD degree or a traditional chemical engineering degree. You need to be just as technically strong as those individuals. So our curriculum has to provide that disciplinary strength, but we also want to provide this cross-disciplinary perspective so that you can work across the disciplines to solve these big problems. So the curriculum structure consists of four core courses, two math courses, two required math courses, which are consistent with all of the math courses required in individual master's programs across the college a course on research methods that we teach in the fall, and a series of four courses on translating discovery into practice, one in each of the four themed areas. So it'll be translating discovery into practice in transportation, in energy, in communications, and in healthcare. Then we have, you continue to build disciplinary strength within your uh, home department of mechanical, chemical, biomedical engineering, and then you take focus area electives within one of your application domains transportation, energy, communications, or healthcare. Those focus area electives may be in your home department, or they may be in another department in the College of Engineering, depending on what's right for you as you talk with your faculty advisor and decide what are the technical strengths that you need to tackle your problem that you're working on. All right, so let's look at, at the curriculum. There's 66 credits. Um, semester credits in the PhD program. So in most PhD programs, the credit requirements are always presented in credits required past the baccalaureate degree. So for a student that has a BS in an engineering degree, from that point forward, there are 66 incremental credits for the doctoral program, minimum. We have core courses that consist of 18 credits. So I talked about two math courses, these engineering analysis courses, the research methods and translating discovery courses we've talked about. And then we also have these application domain uh, seminars. So transportation, energy, communications, and healthcare. One credit each semester for nominally three years in the program. Have disciplinary courses. So this is really intended to build depth within any one of the departments within the College of Engineering. So if you're a mechanical engineer, these would typically be graduate mechanical engineering courses, chemical engineer, et cetera. 
Now these application domain courses may be in your home department or they may be cross-departmental. So let's say you're working on, on a robotics project for transportation. Well, you're going and you happen to be a mechanical engineer. You're going to take your core courses in mechanical engineering, but you may also take an additional robotics course in mechanical, one in electrical, and one in computer engineering. That's perfectly fine. And then you have dissertation research, which is really the heart of a doctoral program, where you identify a problem that's relatively fixed in scope, and then you spend a significant amount of time coming up with your own unique novel solution to that problem. But that problem is going to be motivated by the larger view of what's important in the world. So yes, as an individual, you're going to solve a narrow problem and you're going to be technically very deep on that problem. But unlike the graduates of many other doctoral programs, you're going to be able to articulate where that problem fits into the solution of a global problem. And incidentally, that last comment that I made is specifically the issue that came up time and time again when we surveyed our uh, industry partners on what was lacking in graduates from doctoral programs that they currently hire. So many of you may already be in a master's program in the College of Engineering. So if you are in a master's program, then anywhere between 18 to 24 credits of the coursework that you're already taking towards your master's degree can be transferred in towards the coursework requirements for this doctoral degree. The reason there's a range here, if you're in a dual degree program, a combined BS-MS program, you're already double counting some credits between your master's and your BS degree. Well, under PhD guidelines, we can't count anything that was already counted towards a bachelor's degree. So if you're in a BSMS program, we can count 18 MS courses towards your PhD, 18 credits, but we can't count the uh, dual, dual credits that you counted towards your bachelor's degree. If you're in a straight MS uh, thesis program, for example, you can count up to 24 credits towards your PhD degree, towards the course credits. That will depend on the particular courses that you took. So this is a range. Uh, that would be evaluated for each individual student uh, at the time of admission and, and developing program of plan. So it's kind of the bigger picture view of uh, the program of study. Uh, we're trying to promote uh, a novel concept or an approach to describing this curriculum. Nationally, there's a lot of uh, discussion that is talking about a T-shaped curriculum, where you have the vertical line of the T is depth within a disciplinary field of study, and then the, the hat across the top of the T is to try to give people a broadening experience uh, so that they get a larger view of the world. That's a very common discussion at the national level today. Uh, so in some of the proposals that we've recently put forward to the Department of Education and the National Science Foundation, we're promoting the idea of taking that T-shaped T-shaped curriculum one step further in designing what we call an arrow-shaped curriculum. This particular graphical concept was promoted by Professor Brian Landy from the Chemie Department, and we're really kind of building on that theme. The idea is that we've built a feedback loop right into the curriculum. So we have our application domains. We're continually polling the marketplace of what's important for those four application domains, for those market segments or industries. We take those needs they provide the context for our coursework, and they also provide the application requirements for research that are being done. So as we begin developing research statements, we want to do research statements that are informed by a knowledge of what's important in the world. We want to make sure that the coursework that we're developing is relevant to the needs of the marketplace today. So all of these then kind of form the guiding feathers on our arrow, and we bring them together through the core curriculum to produce graduates that meet industry needs, that are able to solve these problems. So that's why we're describing this as our arrow-shaped curriculum. So there's a couple of key elements in this curriculum that are what we've described as the unique integrating components of it. The way we teach this interdisciplinary research methods course, I'm not going to read this slide to you, it's taught as a series of five modules, but the key element of this course 
is early on in the doctoral program to help give individual students the skills that they need in order to be an effective researcher, in order to continue to do their project well. We've designed this course and the, the material that goes into this course based on uh, several national reports talking about the strengths and weaknesses of doctoral STEM education in the US, science, technology, engineering, and math. There have been a number of landmark reports talking about STEM doctoral education. I quoted one by the Carnegie Foundation here, and it really talks about some of the unique challenges that are faced by other doctoral programs in STEM around the country. So we're trying to address those challenges head on with this core course design. The other thing that I alluded to uh, when we talked about the global and national perspective is the need to do fundamental research and applied research and technology development. And there, there is a well-recognized phenomena that there's a lot of research discovery that happens in universities, some very important good new technology that gets developed that never makes it out of the research lab and gets translated into practice in the commercial marketplace. It's a gulf. We also find that uh, employers of doctoral graduates say many of the graduates that they hire at the advanced PhD level are technically really competent at what they do, but boy, they have a very difficult time explaining what they do to anybody else or explaining why it's important. So that's where we're defining the second course, this core course in the curriculum. We're, we're building on uh, addressing some very specific teamwork and communications issues that have been identified in these national reports where, that are shortages of doctoral education. We're focusing one module exclusively on in innovation, entrepreneurship, and commercialization. RIT is actually a recipient of an NSF I-Core site program. The PIs on that program are uh, Professor Richard DiMartino and Professor Cormier from the Industrial Engineering Department. Professor Kamikar, I think you've had support under the I-Core program. Um, so th there will be an I-Core module in this course. And then because of our site grant, every student working with a faculty member that participates in this I-Core module is eligible to apply for an I-Core supplement to uh, complement the research that they're doing in their doctoral program. So by going through the module, you've automatically qualified to apply for a supplement. Uh, we'll talk about policy and societal context. We believe that this is a unique opportunity for RIT. Uh, RIT here, we have the uh, public policy, um, the Department of Science, Technology, and Public Policy in the College of Liberal Arts. We have several programs in engineering which have dual degree programs, including mechanical and chemical engineering today, and we have more coming in the future where students can get a BS degree in mechanical engineering or chemical engineering and get a master's degree in SciTech public policy, master of, science, master of Science in Public Policy. Well, it's interesting to know, Professor Cressidis, are you here? Okay, so Professor Cressidis is a PI academic director of the New Air Consortium, and it's looking at how we integrate unmanned air systems into the commercial airspace of the United States of America. We're going to have all these unmanned air vehicles. How do we integrate them into the airspace? And of course, there are a host of technical challenges. But one of the most significant challenges of that integration are the public policy and societal challenges of integrating unmanned air, air vehicles into commercial airspace. So Professor Cressidis is actually promoting the idea of, of collaborating with our partners in SciTech public policy so that as we're developing technological solutions, we're also driving policy as well as complying with policy. But we can make a big impact, uh, a bigger impact if we don't try to just solve a problem technically. A technical solution is not always enough. It's the, it's, the prerequisite, but alone doesn't guarantee we're going to deliver a solution. All right, so who can get in, engaged with uh, this particular program? All of the departments in the Kate Gleason College of Engineering are affiliated with this doctoral program. All of the students from all of the BS programs and MS programs across the College of Engineering are uh, eligible to participate. 
I'm going to introduce the application domain leaders for each of the four application domains, transportation, energy, communications, and healthcare, and give program points of contact for myself as well as um, other people that will be helpful with the process. Uh, some of the folks in the audience here today, uh, you'll see on this picture on the screen. This represents the first class of incoming PhD students in the engineering PhD program that started classes this August. So if, if you're on that picture, raise your hand just so people can see who you are. So if you wanna, if you wanna talk to folks that are in the program today, you've got a few partners right here in the classroom that can tell you about what they're, what they're doing and how they're getting engaged. All right. Students from any one of the departments in the College of Engineering, any of those disciplinary backgrounds, are welcome to apply to this doctoral program. Now, for example, I know in this audience we have chemical and biomedical engineering students. You don't currently have a master's degree uh, in accessible to you in your home departments, but you do have this doctoral degree accessible to you. So, any student in this room certainly is eligible to apply for participation in these programs. Every student coming into the program will have kind of a dual affiliation. You're going to have an affiliation with a home department, and you're going to have an affiliation with one of these application domains that kind of describes um, why you're working on a problem or what global societal challenge you're um, focusing on. This is just to give you some idea of various faculty members in the College of Engineering and some of the types of problems that they're working on today. So this represents the grouping of faculty members and how we presented faculty from all across the Kate Gleason College of Engineering when we submitted the proposal to the state of New York and when we have sought um, fellowship funding for this program from the National Science Foundation. So this just indicates that these faculty members have identifiable projects that they're working on in each of these application domains. So if you're interested in a particular application domains, this is a starting point for a list of faculty who may be good candidates for you to work with. Now clearly, we have many faculty members that work across multiple application domains. That's perfectly fine. This is just intended to give students some direction on you know, what, what faculty members are working in what areas. We also have a variety of corporate partners that are already engaged in working with the doctoral program. Every one of the companies uh, listed on this slide actually played a part in developing the proposal for the doctoral program. They will be the first companies to be approached for forming the official advisory committee for the program. And we're certainly looking to recruit additional key corporate partners to play a role as we continue to develop and grow this program. But you can get, kind of get a feeling, and you can see from this list, these are a number of companies that already have pretty strong, well-established relationships with RIT. So it's very natural for us to take that relationship to the next level. The application domain leaders. So Professor Cressidis in the back is the transportation application domain leader. Energy is Dr. Brian Landy. I don't think he's here today. I think he had a conflict. Um, communications is Dr. Andres Kwasinski from the computer engineering department. And our healthcare application domain lead is Dr. Iris Aslani. And Dr. Aslani is here as well. So if you'd like to learn more about these application domains, contact information is listed here. Two of them are right here in the room. Uh, so at least you can kind of connect names and faces with folks. Contact information. My name is Ed Hensel. Uh, Lisa Zimmerman is helping out with administration of this program as we, as we get it launched. I have a student assistant, Melissa. And Laura, I, I was looking for a better picture of you. I'll get it. You've got to get me a better one. Laura, if you raise your hand. Laura will work with all of you on uh, admissions processing. So if you're interested in applying for this program, she works in graduate enrollment services and she'll be helping you uh, navigate through the student admissions process. Let's talk about timeline. If, you, if you're interested in getting engaged, what do you do? Um, we're gonna talk about timelines for both students and, and faculty. And then I wanna make sure we leave a little bit of time for Q&A. All right, for students that are interested in this program, uh, the application deadline for admission for next fall of 2015 is January 15th of 2015. I would strongly encourage you 
uh, to try and get your applications in early. Uh, in particular, you know, I think we get done with finals on the 18th of December. Well, if you're interested in this program, set aside that next day to put the finishing touches on your doctoral application and get it submitted before you take off for the holidays. Um, we're going to begin review of applications on the 1st of November. We're already getting applications for next year for the program. Uh, we're hoping to get um, a significant number of applications for next year. We do anticipate that it's going to be a very competitive admissions process, so I would encourage you not to delay. Uh, we'll have an admissions committee roundtable in January. Uh, we'll have four, four of these roundtables, each one chaired by one of the application domain leads, and we'll have a group of faculty that will be evaluating all of the student applications and making application admissions decisions uh, in a collaborative way. We'll then send notifications of admission and financial aid out to students in the February-March time frame, and we subscribe to the uniform notification deadline for graduate programs of the 15th of April. So just like when you were studying as, a, as an undergraduate, you'd typically have that May 1st deadline where you had to notify your school if you were coming, but graduate programs, that, that's April 15th, right? Tax day. Right. The things that go into an admissions packet for students that are uh, interested in applying to this program are listed here. Uh, in particular, one thing that's uh, rather unique is uh, many programs will require you to submit a statement of purpose. We would particularly like you to write your statement of purpose around one of these four application domains of transportation, energy, communications, or healthcare. What's your personal motivation for wanting to make a difference in the world in that particular field? Are there, are there specific problems that you're interested in working on? That's going to help us match student interests with faculty interests. So that personal statement's very important for making a connection between the student and the faculty member. We, we do expect a minimum GPA of 3.0 in your foundation undergraduate courses. Uh, I will say that admission to the program is highly competitive, but we, we've got a really great group of students this first year out, and I think we're going to have another great group next year as well. Faculty engagement. So many of you are faculty members in the office. Um, I'll be giving a couple of these seminars to give a general overview of the program. This is one of them. I'll be visiting computer and electrical engineering. I'll, I'll be going around to all of the different programs and giving many of these seminars. As soon as we get through these general seminars, I'm going to be uh, making meetings with all of the departments that would like to ask me to come into a departmental faculty meeting, and we'll start talking about uh, a lot of the nuts and bolts with faculty that want to get involved in mentoring a student and how to go about uh, doing that and what the expectations are. Uh, we'll, we're working on marketing of faculty materials to help, just like we expect the statement of uh, purpose of what students are interested in doing, we're going to work with faculty to make sure that all of the faculty have a nice clear description of what they're looking for students to work with them on. Uh, and then in, in the mid-year time frame, we are going to ask faculty members to participate in the application review of the incoming students, and then be in touch with prospective students throughout that process. All right, and so with that, I'll stop my presentation. I'll, I'm just repeating contact information you've already seen there, but uh, see if we can take a few minutes for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Professor Shu. So we, we've posted guidelines. I didn't put those details on the slide, but we do have guidelines on the, on the website that describe um, TOEFL expectations, GRE requirements, that type of thing. I, I, I hate to quote them off the top of my head, but they are on the website. Yes? So students from a bachelor's program in the College of Engineering, a Master of Engineering program in the College of Engineering, or a Master of Science program in the College of Engineering are all eligible to apply for this program. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes, in the back. Um, did you, what year would you apply for this? So 
If, if you're an undergraduate student or a dual degree student, you would typically apply for this program in the academic year uh, during which you're going to be completing your program of study. So if you're going to be completing your thesis in a BSMS program, say by the summer of, this coming summer of 2015, now's the time you would apply. If you're going to be anticipating completing your thesis in anywhere from fall through summer of 2016, you would apply one year from now.